we're going to be talking about how you can become more resilient after a toxic relationship. So if you're somebody who wants to rise above a toxic relationship, in other words, like you're done, you know, you're tired of feeling disempowered. You're tired of feeling like you're still looking for answers. You're tired of wondering why what happened happened and you really want to move forward. This session is for you. Most of us who have come out of a toxic relationship, especially when we're in a relationship with someone with high narcissistic traits, it's not uncommon for us to struggle with tremendous self doubt. It's not uncommon for us to feel like our hearts have been broken. It's not uncommon for us to feel ashamed and embarrassed, sometimes guilty. We feel all of these negative emotions after we have been spit out, spit out by a narcissist who now has devalued us, discarded us and is on to the next source of narcissistic supply. There's a time to grieve all of that. There's a time to, to really, um, wrap your mind around what happened. That takes time. Like after you have ended a relationship with someone with high narcissistic traits, you know, your feet don't hit the ground for a while. It takes a while to like put all the pieces of the puzzle together because where you end up is so far removed from where you began. You know, you start a relationship off with someone who has idealized you. When it comes to a narcissist, the narcissist has an agenda. The narcissist wants to dominate. The narcissist wants to control. The narcissist is looking for power over you in the relationship. They are looking for this one upmanship. You might be someone who is targeted by a narcissist and you might have high empathy and you really want to get to know this person and you believe in this veneer that they represent to you. And you are completely like blindsided when the nitpicking starts or when the uh, comments start, like you don't know where it's coming from, but you tend to like, okay, just roll with it thinking, okay, maybe it's going to get better. I don't want to make a big deal out of nothing. He or she has all of these amazing traits. You know, maybe if I don't put the coffee cup on the coffee table, maybe they won't be so angry tomorrow. It turns out that they're angry about where you put the toothpaste or they're angry about where you put the fish food. It's never ending because with the narcissist, the goal is to maintain dominance, right? And so you might have entered into a relationship with the narcissist, really wanting to seek a connection, really wanting to get to know this person. You have exposed your vulnerabilities to this person and they've been exploited. It's taking you a little bit of time to recognize that, wow, the narcissist really never exposed himself or herself to me. It was all about them gaining my trust and me opening myself up to them. And now you're being devalued and you're being discarded. All of these vulnerabilities are being, being thrown in your face. It's a very, very painful experience. It's horrifying. And when this relationship is coming to an end, it takes time to like find the pattern. And that's um, they are predictable when we're dealing with people with high narcissistic traits, they tend to be predictable. It's an uncomfortable pattern to recognize, but it does help to know that, okay, I'm not the only one that this has happened to. And you know, if I can gain some objectivity here, I can see the pattern. I can see what happened. And what this will do is that will raise your level of self-awareness and allow you to be able to discern what happened, the pattern that took place. And it'll also allow you to be a little bit more aware moving forward. But there's a big piece of the puzzle that we can't spiritually bypass in essence. No. When I was doing my emotional recovery work, I had to come to terms with the fact that I was the common denominator, that none of the men that I dated knew each other. And so what was up with me? And I came to realize that my codependency, my lack of self-worth, right? Growing up feeling like love was conditional, growing up, under very controlling parents, growing up feeling criticized, growing up feeling guilted and ashamed, all led into why it was that I ended up in relationships with men who were more narcissistic than anything. But I can't ignore the fact that I was the common denominator, that there was something with me because it didn't end. Thought that once I got divorced that 
my problems were over. Oh, my relationship with my ex-husband was codependent. I didn't realize that I was the one who had these, who was highly emotionally immature, who was not self-aware and who was perpetuating cycles within myself and in my relationships that I was unaware of. And it was enlightening and it was um, awakening when I realized like, wow, you know, it's not just my relationship, it's me. I'm carrying this inability to show up authentically and to think maturely. This is me. This is, this is me. This is what I'm carrying forward. And what I eventually learned to do in every relationship, I have to say, I grew from every relationship. I mean, it, it would really be nice to say that, you know, we all come from healthy homes and our parents model healthy boundaries and our parents model unconditional love and our parents model, you know, patience and our, and our parents model what it is we need to learn to become resilient people. It'd be awesome. But for many of us, that's just not the case. And I don't think that's playing the victim. I think that's just explaining what happened. You know, this is not a woe is me, poor pat me on the back, poor Lisa. There are people out there that had far worse childhoods than I did. Let me tell you, I've coached them. You know, you read about people who have had horrible, horrific childhoods, right? And so this isn't a woe is me pity party. This is someone who's trying to understand herself and then maybe offer some of the things that I've learned to other people so that they can empower themselves so that a relationship with a narcissist doesn't have to make you feel like you're stuck. I think the goal really is for all of us is to overcome the ego, is to have an ego death so that we can rise above what's happened in the past and maybe even heal generational karma. If we can integrate the past and we can make peace with the past in the now, then we can affect our future. But that doesn't happen if all we do is focus on the person outside of us. And that doesn't help us if we're pointing the finger and we're never looking within. It does not help us. All that does is keep us stuck. And so I like to learn about resiliency. I like to feel like if a challenge is before me, that I'm going to be able to rise up and face that challenge. Because I've learned that in my life that, that there's no rescue boat coming. And that was a terrifying thought. I think as children, we think that our parents are supposed to be that rescue boat, but in lots of the cases, they're not. They're not rescuing you. If anything, parents can harm you. They can abuse you. Not all parents. And I would think that in lots of the cases, parents think they're doing the right thing and in, in very innocuous ways might be harming their children without even realizing it. And I think that goes back to being unaware, not having the right life skills and being raised by people who didn't have very good life skills. And so what choice do we have? If, if we realize like someone like me, for instance, I realize like Lisa, none of these men know each other. It's you. There's something going on with you and you've got to change it. So what's wrong is yes, the relationship, but what is it about you that's wrong that is making it very difficult and impossible for you to have a healthy relationship? I am very happy to report that my relationship with my current husband, I feel is a very healthy relationship. We are able to communicate. I'm able to be vulnerable. I'm able to trust. He's able to be vulnerable and he's able to, able to trust. We're able to open ourselves up and tell each other what we really think. Even the tough stuff, the stuff like, uh, you know, I don't like that you said that, or, uh, you know what? I don't like that you did that. Or Lisa, can you stop doing that please? These are conversations that we're both able to have. They're not easy conversations, but we're able to have them because integrity as is at the top of our list. Respecting ourselves and respecting one another is at the top of our list. So we're all here to grow up. We're all here to transcend. We all have very fragile egos. Let's face it. We have all been wounded, right? And so we're trying to figure it out. One of the things that, like I said earlier, I love to do is learn about how to become more and more resilient because 
life is going to throw things at you. We all know people who struggle with terrible situations. I mean, from the loss of a child to cancer, to losing someone to cancer, to having cancer ourselves, to dealing with infertility or miscarriages, to sudden deaths, to car accidents, to you name it, you know, life can be very unpredictable and we're all going to suffer. If you are a human being, you're going to suffer. It's not peaches and roses and ice cream and strawberries and, and sprinkles for all of us all the time. It's just not realistic. And so it is unrealistic to think that we are not going to be faced with challenges. We are going to be faced with personal challenges and we're going to be faced with challenges inside our relationships. I think the important thing to remember is what are we going to do about it? And how can I take whatever is going on in my life from the past to the now, and how can I learn and how can I grow from it? And we don't grow from just complaining about what has happened to us. We grow by asking ourselves self-inquiring questions. We grow by fixating ourselves on a goal. We grow by understanding what is my why? Like, why did I get up today? Why am I listening to this? You know, what, what is it do I want to get out of this, this conversation? What is it that I want out of my life? How am I showing up in my life? What am I doing wrong? You know, one of the things that I try to convey in my work is that if I was tying my shoelaces incorrectly, I would really want someone to tap me on the shoulder and say, um, Lisa, like, you're not doing that correctly. Why? So that I could fix it. I, I want to know what I'm doing wrong. And in relationships, when I was in therapy and my therapist told me that I was codependent and that I was showing up in an immature way in my marriage, that I was not setting boundaries, that my feet were not stapled to the floor, that me expecting him to change was not the right way to go about things. I was so grateful. I was like, oh, thank you for letting me know what I was doing wrong because I had no clue what I was doing wrong. I mean, that's really making it, you know, sound really easy. It's a lot deeper than that because I learned as a child to believe that I didn't have a right to be happy. I didn't have a right to even be unhappy. I didn't have a right to express myself. And so my needs came out sideways my truth came out sideways. I didn't know how to express myself in a healthy way. My father got angry. My mother got angry. These were people that did not come to the table and communicate. My mother would express her anger when my father wasn't around. So she taught me to hide my emotions, that it was bad to have an emotion and express that emotion to a man. So hide your emotions, put your lipstick on, make believe everything's okay. That's no bueno. That is totally unhealthy. And what did my mother do? My mother was passive aggressive. And so rather than have a sit down and have a conversation with my father about how she was really feeling about his personality, his need to dominate and everything else, she was passive aggressive. So these were my models. So I think on the road to recovery, we have to be really honest with how we're showing up that because it's not going to work. Otherwise you can spiritually bypass all you want. You're going to end up where you started and you're going to end up recycling the drama in your life until you finally sit still and you finally look within. For me personally, I got to a point in my life where it was just obvious that I was the common denominator and I couldn't escape it. And I wanted to heal. I also recognized that, that I was a model for my children, just like my parents were a model for me. And I couldn't escape that responsibility. I couldn't run from my codependency anymore. I couldn't run from my own personality flaws. I had to do something to fix it. I had to get a hold of my ego. I had to heal my inner child and I had to do the tough stuff that was necessary so that I no longer carried around this dysfunctional way of relating to other people. And I did not want to be one of those people that just blamed everybody else for why I was where I was. Certainly it's valid when you have been targeted by a narcissist for no reason. And sometimes that happens that is completely unfair and that is completely unjust. 
But even in those situations when we have been targeted, let's say by a narcissistic boss or a, a narcissistic coworker and our projects are being sabotaged and there's a smear campaign and it's all yucky stuff is taking place, you know, absolutely it is unfair and it is unjust. And we can, and we do have the right to say, this is ridiculous, this should have never happened. But at some point, if we want to put it in the past, we have to find creative ways to rise above it, essentially so the narcissist doesn't win. So narcissism doesn't win. Narcissism is living below the veil of consciousness. It is a wounded ego that does not have the ability to check itself. And we don't want to be equal to a wounded ego that cannot check itself. We want to rise above that. So I was listening to a YouTube video recently and I found this speaker to be absolutely brilliant. She's actually someone who studies resiliency. And she found herself at a point in her life where she needed to put all of her studies to the test, all of her research to the test when her 12 year old daughter was killed instantly in a car accident. And she was de devastated and she had a new identity, her entire world shifted and here she was grieving and the grieving counselors that showed up for her, the resources that were made available to her made her feel worse because they perpetuated the idea that she was a victim, that her husband was a victim and that their marriage probably wouldn't survive and that she was looking at least, looking at at least five heavy years of grieving. And she basically expressed herself by saying that I just felt worse by what was supposed to make me feel better. And she realized that she had to come up with ways to help her feel better about the situation that she was in. Talk about resiliency. And she went on to ask the audience, like who here has suffered a miscarriage? Who here, here has been cheated on? who here has, you know, had this happen to them, have that happen to them. And before you knew it, the entire, almost the entire Ted talk audience was standing on their feet. Her point was, I think was that we all have challenges. And that was actually her first, uh, takeaway moment was that she said that studying resiliency taught her a number of things. And the one, number one thing that she learned was that people that have resilient natures are those that recognize that other people struggle too. In other words, there has to be a mind shift where we're like, okay, this happened, but I'm not going to be a victim to it. I'm going to rise above it. And so in studying people with high resiliency, she noted that people who have gone through horrific challenges in their life, there was something about the way that they perceive the world. And it was, stuff happens to everybody. I am not unique. Why should someone else go through this and not me? I'm not any better than that person that this kind of stuff should not happen to me. If it's going to happen to someone else, why wouldn't it happen to me? And she went on to explain that it was this idea that it depersonalized whatever tragedy people were going through. And it helped the people that were going through the tragedy feel less alone and made it less personalized. And it really helped her shift. In other words, in her mindset, if, if children are dying, it should never happen to anyone. But if children die in car accidents, why should it happen to my neighbor and not happen to someone like me? And it, it can be a difficult thought to wrap your mind around as a parent, because it is the most challenging thing I think to have to get over in your life. But think about the mindset that she developed in order to move, move and make a shift to help her develop resiliency during this very tragic time. I think those of us who have come from difficult homes, those of us who have found ourselves in abusive relationships and are struggling to figure out what the heck is going on, we can learn a lot from that piece of information. We can learn a lot from recognizing that suffering is not just something that we do. Some, suffering is universal. I think it can help us feel less alone and it can help us embrace our vulnerabilities rather than shut down and recoil because we have vulnerabilities. 
it can really help us learn to trust ourselves and even learn to trust other people in the future. In a narcissistic relationship, you don't have trust in yourself. You don't trust your internal reality. That's what gaslighting and trauma bonding does, right? You're gaslighted and you're blamed for being gaslighted. And then they abandon you and they make you believe that it's your fault that they're abandoning you. And you know, they're so clever in their justifications that you start to wonder if you deserved to be abused. And so it does take time to unravel this. I'm just hoping that this information in time might be useful to you as you move forward on the healing path. Another thing that this speaker said was that resilient people are really good at choosing to focus on what they can control versus what they cannot control. I talk about this all the time. If there is anything that saves my butt day in and day out, it is checking in with myself and asking myself a couple of questions like, are you trying to control something you have no right to control? Are you focusing on something that you can't control? Are you acting as if you have a right to control that thing? These questions keep me in check. And so this skill is learnable and it is teachable. And for people who are struggling to get a handle on what is taking place in their relationships, those who learn from toxic relationships are those who want to seek and grow from these painful experiences. While it may be tempting for us to pull the blankets over our head and call it quits on relationships and never trust anyone again because we're so afraid of being hurt again, it might be tempting to do that. If you can take on this attitude like, I can learn and I can grow from this. You in time will become more and more resilient. Your, Your mindset. mindset will shift. You'll develop a growth mindset, a more positive mindset, and you'll through self accountability, you become more self-reliant. So here's some questions to ask yourself. Can you control the past? No. Can you control someone with high narcissistic traits? No. Can you control your parents? No. Can you control your sister? No. Can you control flying monkeys? No. Can you control a smear campaign? No. All you can do is control what you focus on that you can control. So here's a tip. Try to remember that it's never okay to control anyone. And yes, that includes a narcissist. It is never okay to take on the abusive traits of someone who has abused you. Although many people in long-term relationships tend to do so. And they have decided rather than leave, which is the healthy thing to do, they have decided that, you know what? I'm going to push back. I'm going to bite back. I'm going to be as vindictive, vindictive. I'm going to be as passive aggressive. I'm going to snow stonewall. All that is doing is keeping you stuck. You're not rising above the relationship. A narcissist is living below the veil of consciousness and they win if they're able to goat you. Your energy, you fighting back is power and control. You are not growing. You are not living your best life. You are not making yourself a healthier, happier person. And so the narcissist wins if you stay in this type of an abusive relationship. And you have to ask yourself, you know, you, do we have a right to complain about someone if we are engaging in the same behaviors? It's a really important question to ask yourself. And if you are fair with yourself, you will answer the, the question fairly. It will hurt like someone stuck on a, a knife in your foot but it is a question that a narcissist is never going to ask themselves. And if they do, they're not going to answer it fairly. And so if we're going to rise above a narcissistic toxic relationship, we must be honest with ourselves. So checking in with yourself allows you to heal in incredible ways. Rather than feel stuck, you are shifting the gears and developing a warrior mentality. You are acknowledging what has taken place while focusing on what is within your ability to control. Have I allowed resentments to build up over time to fuel my anger rather than deal with my negative emotions in a healthy way? Have I sought help or am I instead focusing on trying to control what I really cannot control? Do I spend time on YouTube and listening to podcasts to gain ammunition against my narcissistic partner instead of trying to really rise above these relationship dynamics. I get it. If you don't have life skills, you don't know where to turn, but it's important that you're clear about why you're doing what you're doing. If you're seeking information, is it to gain ammunition against someone that you think is abusive because that's abusive? Or are you seeking information to be enlightened, to be awakened and to find the resources 
and the skills you need to really shift and bring about true change in your life. You're the only person that can answer that question fairly and honestly. So by asking yourself these provocative questions, you get to pluck out the thoughts and beliefs that are keeping you stuck. Many victims of psychological abuse believe they are powerless, and in some cases they are. However, for those of us who are not entirely powerless, the only way to heal from narcissistic abuse is to view ourselves as objectively as possible. Because remember, a narcissist mentality is victim. And we want to make sure that we are not taking on the narcissist mentality as victim, even though we have been a victim, okay? This is not victim blaming. It is never your fault if someone has abused you in a narcissistic way. It is never your fault. In a healthy situation, we would not be having these conversations. In a healthy, healthy world, there would be no narcissists. There would be no people who were enablers, right? So we enable narcissists. We, we acquiesce to narcissists. We fawn after narcissists. Okay, I get it. But when we recognize that we have these patterns of codependency within us, or we have, we have tendencies and we have high narcissistic traits ourselves and we become, we get involved with a narcissist. We are less narcissistic if we can check ourselves. So if you're able to check yourself, that is a wonderful thing. Grab that baton and run with it because someone who is highly narcissistic is not going to want to check themselves. They're going to want to say and believe and to feel and perpetuate this idea that they are the victim. You hurt them. They didn't hurt you. There's nothing wrong with them. And if they were abusive to you, you deserved it. This is the way a narcissist thinks. Now, an objective mind who is perhaps engaging in that type of behavior will be able to see it and will be able to change it. And that is a wonderful thing. In my own life, I was able to see how I was engaging in unhealthy behaviors, how rather than set a boundary, I felt stuck. I felt stuck because I didn't have the life skills to get unstuck. But once I recognized that and I saw that I was as unhealthy as he was, it was all hands on deck. I was going to do anything to absolutely change and shift because I didn't want my children to have a victim mentality and think that they were powerless. I wanted my children to be able to say, I need to look at myself so I never do this thing again. I wanted to empower my children. And so I'm just hoping that this information is coming off that way and you're receiving this information in the intention that it is, that, that I am offering it to you. So the third point the speaker makes has to do with self-inquiring self questions that she taught herself to ask. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. The question that she asked herself while grieving the death of her precious 12-year-old daughter is, is what I am doing now helping me or hurting me? She went on to explain that, you know, she found herself at nighttime uh, looking over her daughter's pictures and she had to stop herself and she asked herself, is this helping me or is this hurting me? Because she couldn't sleep afterwards. So it was hurting her. And so she would ask herself the objective question, is this helping you or hurting you? And she would put the pictures to, away and she'd fall asleep or she tried to fall asleep. This is absolutely brilliant. How many of us after a narcissistic relationship or a toxic relationship has ended, how many of us are on Facebook checking out what our partners or ex-partners are doing? Is this helping you or harming you, right? And so I wanted to offer you some questions that I thought might be able to help you and use this amazing speaker's point to your advantage. Why? So you can develop a, a self-reliant and reliant personality or, or re resilience mindset so that a narcissist no longer wins in your life. So you break through, you break free. When we are hurting, it is not uncommon for us to call a friend and talk about our problems. We can feel validated by those who understand what we are going through. It is important, however, to recognize the goal is to heal and to rise above the level of consciousness that got us into trouble into the first place. Einstein says you can never solve a problem with the same level of intelligence that created the problem. So we went into a relationship with a certain level of self-awareness. Now, if we don't raise that level of self-awareness, 
it's almost guaranteed that we're either not going to ever be in a relationship again because we've decided to cut ourselves off, which is not healthy. It's a protective defensive mechanism, or we're going to recreate this again in the future because the same level of intelligence that got us into trouble is, is at the, at the wheel of our ship and we're going right into another relationship in time. So it's really important that we understand coming out of these relationships, our mindset must shift. We can point the finger all we want, but unless our level of intelligence, our level of awareness shifts from point A to point B, we're going to end up in a similar relationship. It's really hard to swallow, but it is what it is. And this is the only way to fix this. So, you know, anger is very healthy in lots of the cases when you have been a victim of psychological abuse. I think it helps us heal. Actually, there's a, there's a time where we should absolutely be angry, but in the back of your head, always remember that your growth is going to come after that, your growth is going to come once you're able to develop resilient, resilient tools to help you develop a more resilient growth mindset. I have to also say that in some cases of narcissistic abuse, where narcissistic abuse has absolutely been absolutely punishing. It has been torturing. I've had clients tell me that without my anger, I feel like I'm going to dissolve. It's not for me to tell this person, you have to release your anger. I would never tell anyone that all I would say to them is that if you're ever able to shift that, then you're going to feel less heavy, but it's not for me to tell, tell a victim of narcissistic abuse that you have to let go of this anger. Sometimes the anger is all we have, right? And it's, if you've been a victim of narcissistic abuse, this type of horrible abuse, you know what I'm talking about. Like I need to hold on to this right now. I'm not ready to move into phase two or phase three or phase four of the healing process. This is where I need to be right now. Okay. I get it. Just put this in the back of your head that maybe one day, maybe one day, maybe one day you can ask yourself, is this helping me or is this hurting, hurting you in a situation where you're holding on to anger, it might be that that anger is actually helping you right now. And I get that this is not a one size fits all journey. And when you're listening to information by, from people who are offering their experiences, coaches, experts, psychologists, and alike, it's important that you take away information that resonates with you and throw the rest away. We're all at different stages of the recovery journey. And one speaker will speak to you. Another speaker will speak to you. One speaker will turn you off. Another speaker will turn you on. So it's important that you recognize this isn't a one size fits all. It's not a cookie cutter reality. You know, this is a very individualized experience and depending on what type of psychological or narcissistic abuse that you have been through very much de de determines your path moving forward. So, Ask yourself these tough questions. Is stalking my ex on Facebook helping me or harming me? Is retaliating with back and forth text helping me or harming me? Is calling his new supply helping me or harming me? Is smearing her name helping me or harming me? Is mulling over old photos helping me or harming me? Is telling, calling myself names helping me or harming me? Is feeling ashamed of mistakes helping me or harming me? Is therapy helping me or harming me? Is exercise helping me or harming me? Is staying up all night crying on the phone with my best friend, is it really helping me or is it harming me? Is jumping into another relationship helping me or harming me? If you're looking to rise up after a toxic relationship, the key is to focus on what you can control. The key is really to keep your eye on the goal. Understanding your why is so important. When I recognize that looking within my why for looking within was, was rooted in looking forward. I didn't want my children to feel like victims. I didn't want them to feel powerless due to circumstances. And if they ever found themselves in a situation with someone who was highly narcissistic, I wanted them to develop the resiliency to figure out how they got there and what they needed to do to get out 
and what they needed to do to grow from the relationship. I firmly believe that we are here to learn and we are here to grow and we're all going to stumble and we're all going to fall and we're all going to make fools out of ourselves and we're all going to feel embarrassed and we're never going to get this 100% right. But what we can do is we can check in with the self and we can make sure that we are growing as we're moving forward. We can make sure that as people come into our life, we're staying objective and we're making healthy decisions. And the more aware we can be, the more self-aware, the self-accountable we can be, the more self-reliant we can be, the more resilient we can become. So if you're the kind of person that really wants to heal and you don't want to carry the resentment of a toxic relationship around with you for the rest of your life, try to focus on five things you're grateful for every day. I know it's not easy, but I'm telling you that research proves that people who, even though they've been through a tragedy, People who turn around and say, well, I'm grateful for this and I'm grateful for that and I'm grateful for this, they end up being happier in the long run. Milking a state of gratitude is key. It is not easy, but it is teachable and it is learnable. And if you are one of those people that wants to win after narcissistic abuse, if you do not want to stay on the same vibration as a narcissist, you must develop resilient techniques so that you can develop a growth mindset and you can overcome the past. In time, if you develop self-resiliency, what will happen is you're going to learn to trust yourself. Your spirit of discernment is going to go through the roof. You're going to honestly and all day long authentically check in with yourself. You're not going to be afraid to ask yourself the tough questions like, was that a codependent thing that you just did? Are you seeking validation? Are you ignoring red flags? Are you idealizing this person? Are you moving too fast? Are you having sex way too early? You know, you're going to be able to ask yourself these really intriguing questions. And what that's going to do is that's going to increase your ability to make healthier choices. So you are policing yourself. This is the key. We cannot continue to be afraid to ask ourselves these tough questions. And so if you are here to win after narcissistic abuse, I really hope these tips help you to develop a more resilient mindset. My name is Lisa A. Romano. I'm the Breakthrough Life Coach and Bestselling Author. And if you'd like to listen to one of my books for free, just go to audible.com or you can click one of the links in the description box. If you'd like to learn more about my online programs, go to www.lisaaromano.com. The good news is it is possible to teach yourself and learn life skills that you didn't learn as a child so that you can live an empowered life. Never give up dear ones. And when you're out and about, never forget to think. Bye for now. If you love this content, check out the next video and don't forget to click the link below so you can take the codependency quiz. You grew up feeling anxious. You grew up feeling like it was your job to manage the emotions of the narcissistic parent. Narcissistic parents can be extremely controlling. They can be possessive of you. They can make you feel and send you the vibe that it's your job to make the family proud.